There's a high stakes meeting happening at the White House today, and it is focused on infrastructure. President Biden will meet with West Virginia Senator Shelley Moore Capito. She's in charge of Republican efforts to negotiate a bipartisan package. And Weijia Jiang is following this for us from the White House. So Weijia, how close are the two sides to possibly reaching a deal? Good morning, Emory. They are getting closer, but they're not there yet. And now the White House says they want to see a clear path forward at the least by Monday. But they are worried that if a divided Senate cannot even find compromise on this, which has widespread public support, that they won't be able to achieve anything else on President Biden's agenda. But right now, we know that the GOP package includes $1 trillion about for projects to fix roads, bridges, and rails. Closer to President Biden's current $1.7 trillion proposal. But the White House is drawing attention to several things that are not funded in the GOP package, like fixing veterans' hospitals, removing dangerous lead pipes, and funding clean energy jobs. As the debate continues, the president took a rare swipe at two members of his own party. I hear all the folks on TV saying, why doesn't Biden get this done? Well, because Biden only has a majority of effectively four votes in the House and a tie in the Senate with two members of the Senate who vote more with my Republican friends. President Biden is referencing two moderate Democrats, West Virginia's Joe Manchin and Arizona's Kirsten Sinema. They are breaking with him and most Democrats by opposing a corporate tax hike to pay for the infrastructure plan. The president is making moves in the Arctic, though. His administration just announced an end to a Trump-era oil drilling program in Alaska at a wildlife refuge that is considered sacred ground by an indigenous group. Anne-Marie? Hmm. All right, so Weijia, you mentioned uh, that the GOP infrastructure proposal leaves out certain provisions that the president really supports. Um, and the two parties are also at odds as to how this should be paid for. Uh, the Republicans sort of feel like there's a, a whole lot of money that's been left on the table for COVID relief that could help to pay for this. The complete opposite uh, for uh, the, the president. He says you got to raise taxes um, on certain groups. So how are these differences impacting negotiations? Because both sides um, seem uh, fairly sort of set when it comes to right. those two things. Yes, they are. And it's a major sticking point because even if they figure out the substance of the package that they agree on, you're right. How to foot the bill is a very different story. And the president wants to raise the current corporate tax rate, which is 21 percent, to somewhere between 25 and 28 percent, which is something Republicans have said they will not support. They want to increase user fees as one way to pay for this, like gas taxes, for example. And that's something that President Biden says um, he will not do because it's something that he promised that, you know, families making a certain income would not have to pay more taxes. And even though a fee is not not, not exactly a tax, it is more money out of their pockets. And so um, it's mm -hmm. unclear how they're going to move forward on this, Anne Marie, because someone has to budge somewhere, and it doesn't look like either side is going to do that when it comes to uh, the money. Yeah. Um, the president also spoke yesterday about efforts in states across the country to change voting laws. Here's some of what he had to say on that issue. This sacred right is under assault with incredible intensity like I've never seen, even though I got started as a public defender and a civil rights lawyer. With an intensity and aggressiveness that we've not seen in a long, long time. It's simply un-American. So I feel like, uh, you know, Ouija, but you would know better than me that th these are sort of the strongest words that we've heard from the president on this matter. And then he went a step further and he announced that Vice President Kamala Harris will be leading the White, White House efforts on voting rights. What do we know about what that entails? Well, we don't know the specific details yet, but she did release a pretty lengthy statement to lay out um, the broad outlines of what she plans to do and really views this as um, a two-tiered issue that she's going to uh, really drill in on. The first is making sure she's working with local communities and states and different organizations um, to educate people, to let them know exactly what their voting rights are. The second is to change the law of the land, and that 
has to be done um, on Capitol Hill. So she will serve as sort of a liaison, leading the efforts on the legislative side to try to get something done. But that's going to be really hard, as we kind of alluded to earlier, um, because this Congress is so divided. And even though we've seen Democrats um, go at it alone, if you will, without a single Republican vote on, on the COVID relief package, as an example, and even though that's a discussion for the infrastructure plan, that's not an option for something like voting rights, because in order to use that process that allows Democrats to move forward without the GOP, it has to be related to the budget, and voting rights is not. Um, and so they have to find the numbers. And that's exactly why the president called out Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, because they could, um, you know, come together with other Democrats to get rid of what's known as a filibuster, which is basically blocking a piece of legislation from getting to the floor at all. Um, you need a certain number of votes to do that. And because they don't have that with Republicans, you know, it's sort of like a, a stalemate, unless these two senators were to give in and say that they would support getting rid of that filibuster, and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. And so all that to say that she has a lot of work ahead of her, especially when it comes to that congressional component of trying to change the laws. Mm -hmm. um, so right in the tail, at the tail end there, you mentioned that the Biden administration announced yesterday that it's suspending oil leases in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. I think at the tail end of the Trump administration, they tried to sort of auction off drilling rights. There wasn't a right. lot of pickup for it. And perhaps it's because, um, you know, businesses were, companies were anticipating what the Biden administration would do. But why is this announcement significant? Well, this is something that, um, you know, Democrats and Republicans have been fighting over for several decades because uh, it is a wildlife refuge that we're talking about. It is the home of, uh, you know, many animals that could be in jeopardy if there is widespread drilling there. On the other hand, um, there could be billions and billions of barrels of oil there, and, and that's why, um, you know, Republicans, including the former president, have supported beginning different programs to drill into it. And so this is a campaign promise kept by President Biden, um, so far at least, because he said that he was going to protect um, these sacred lands. Uh, and so what we know now is that it's not a no, um, it is a pause. So they are going to evaluate uh, the, the data there. They're going to look at what the Trump administration found. They're going to um, analyze the real impact on the wildlife before making any firm and final decision about whether this program will resume. Mm. All right, Weijia Zhang, thank you. Sure.